All right. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask before I begin my lecture for today? All right, let, let, me, let me tell you what we're going to try to cover uh, this week. I, I had sent an email to all of you, and uh, I had given a rough idea that what we want to do is we want to, by the end of this week, be able to get to the period 1857-1858, uh, which marks the rebellion in India. But today I'm going to begin with Aurangzeb once again. I'm going to spend a few minutes on him. Uh, and describe to you the circumstances under which the Mughal Empire begins to fragment, get decimated, and then move on to the East India Company, the founding of the East India Company, and the coming of the Europeans to India, in particular the English. So that's essentially what we're going to try to cover today. And on Wednesday, I'm going to describe to you, so we will look at a little bit of the expansion of the company as well today, but on Wednesday, I'm going to describe to you the expansion of British rule in India, uh, the various kinds of political negotiations that went on between the company and various Indian rulers, uh, and the various circumstances under which the company was able to considerably expand its territories and finally gain a foothold uh, and uh, uh, in India, commencing with what is called the Battle of Plassey in 1757. But let me uh, wind up with Aurangzeb. So you recall what I would mentioned to you about the Emperor Aurangzeb, who dies in 1707, that when Aurangzeb came to the throne, uh, the argument that has been advanced by people like Nehru and various other secular-minded historians is that, in fact, what Aurangzeb did was he set the clock back. Right? In, in other words, that Akbar had a policy of toleration. Uh, this was a policy that was, in fact, one of the so-called pillars of Mughal rule. And it is Aurangzeb's policies that, in fact, left to the, led to the undoing of the Mughal Empire. Uh, and, and, uh, and in quick serial order, I would mentioned a number of things to you. See, for, uh, so when he comes to power, when Aurangzeb assumes power within a period of 15 to 20 years, uh, we find that he's going to outlaw Hindu religious fairs, he's going to outlaw the practice of darshan, prohibits the construction of Hindu temples. Uh, we find as well that he's going to appoint religious censors, right? Uh, the duty paid by merchants is going to be doubled by Hindu, the duty paid by Hindu merchants on commercial goods is going to be doubled from 2.5% to 5%, uh, and so forth and so on, right? Now, the picture is a little bit more complicated, and in fact, actually, in recent years, many of the historians have actually dwelt on some, some of the structural reasons that might have led to the decline of the Mughal Empire. Uh, but what's worthwhile mentioning in particular here is the fact that there is, I think, now a body of opinion which, in fact, argues that we have to look at Aurangzeb's relations to Hindus in a different light. So, for example, the story that used to be very commonly circulated was that there was a kind of a mindless destruction of Hindu temples that took place in Aurangzeb's reign. And there are historians such as Richard Eaton, who gave a talk at, on, at, at this campus about eight or ten years ago, uh, and he's got a large body of published work uh, related to that talk as well, where he tried to show that, in fact, there were very particular temples that were destroyed, but these were very limited in number, and there were very specific reasons why these temples were destroyed. If, in fact, for example, a temple was used as a place of resistance to Mughal rule, then it was likely to be destroyed. Right? So if it stood on the war path, right, it was likely to be destroyed, so forth and so on. Now, there's some interesting, interesting uh, facts that we have to look at. So you recall the quotation I'd given to you from John F. Richards, another historian who specialized on the Mughal period. And I, and I want to just give the quotation to you again. He says, quote, Aurangzeb's ultimate aim was conversion of non-Muslims to India, to, to Islam. Whenever possible, the emperor gave out robes of honor, cash gifts, and promotions to converts. It quickly became known that conversion was a sure way to the emperor's favor. All right? And you might say that the imposition of the jizya, for example, which might have been an inducement for non-Muslims to convert because the jizya is, of course, imposed on the non-Islamic subjects uh, of, the, of the emperor, right? 
But the question that we would have to ask is, is there concrete evidence of policies favoring Islam? What were the kinds of inducements that might have been offered? It's very interesting, for example, that the percentage of Hindus employed as mansabdars rose from about 24% in the reign of Shah Jahan to 33% in the fourth decade of Aurangzeb's reign. So in other words, the representation of Hindus in very high position, because remember who the Mansabdars are, right? The Mansabdars are part of this hierarchical elite, military elite system. And these are people who are represented at the court that each of them has their own small little army, right? And they can be called upon to assist the emperor, right? Now the number of Mansabdars, we find, increases substantially during the reign of Aurangzeb, right? So if you look at evidence like this, I'm suggesting to you that it's, it's a bit mixed and we perhaps might not want to be too hasty in trying to come to the conclusion that Aurangzeb was tyrannical to the degree to which he's usually depicted. Right? I don't think that there's any question that there is some degree of hostility that you're going to find in him as somebody who is an orthodox Sunni to the infidels. Right? But I think that we would have to have a reassessment, which obviously in this course, given that this is an introductory kind of course, we can't. And I'm suggesting to you that the picture that we have of Aurangzeb might be a bit more complex. Now, one of the things that led to the undermining of the empire is that you have a three-pronged kind of resistance to him. And this is what these arrows pointing upwards to Aurangzeb are indicating. So there is a contest going on between Aurangzeb and the Sikhs. And we know that the, that the Sikh gurus, a number of the Sikh gurus have been martyred. Guru Tegh Bahadur is going to be martyred, right? He's going to be asked to convert by Aurangzeb and he's going to be unwilling to do that. So if you look at the Sikhs, what we're describing here is some kind of obviously, some kind of religious conflict between him, be, between Aurangzeb and the Sikhs. There's also economic unrest and the economic unrest is for a large number of reasons. One of the principal reasons for that has to do with the fact that Aurangzeb has this huge and very expensive campaign, right, to reclaim parts of the Deccan. And I had described to you in my previous lecture the size of the army that had accompanied Aurangzeb in his campaign down in the south. Now, when you're going to have an expensive military campaign, it's going to re increase the revenue demand very considerably. Right? And the people who are going to be concerned are the Jats, who are the peasants, in North India, right, in the area around Haryana and Punjab today, right, that area, right, so there is economic unrest and this is the other prong, pronged, you know, the other prong of this multi-pronged attack that I'm speaking about against, against Aurangzeb. And then finally you have Shivaji and the Marathas. Now I started talking to you a little bit about Shivaji, I want to spend a bit more time on him. So Shivaji is born in 1627. Uh, dies in, in, in 1680. Very controversial figure for lots of reasons. Um, if any one of you has ever been to Mumbai in recent years, you would notice that virtually every major building, official state building, is named after Shivaji. Okay? You know, the Mumbai airport, the major, major train station, right? Huge number of institutions have all been named after him. Quite often he is represented as the first nationalist. Okay? I don't think that that characterization is very helpful because uh, I'm not quite sure that Shivaji had in mind anything that we might call a nation state. And of course you don't really have to necessarily have in mind a nation state. You could have nationalist sentiments. I mean think of Renan's very famous essay, What is a Nation? published in the second half of the 19th century where he's trying to describe what is it that makes us feel that we have national sentiments. It might be common ties of race or blood or some common memories perhaps, right? But nonetheless, no matter how fluid a definition you take of what it means to be a nation and what it means to have national sentiments, I think that there's a question mark that we have to put next to the assessment of Shivaji as the first Indian nationalist. He might certainly be viewed as the father of the Maratha nation, so he comes from Western India, from the area that today is described as a state of Maharashtra, Okay, his father Shahiji was in the employ of the Sultan of Ahmednagar. So the Sultan of Ahmednagar is one of the sultans in, down in the Deccan. 
Um, and his father actually switches loyalty a number of times. So he switches loyalty to the Sultan of Bijapur, and in fact actually even switches loyalty to the Mughal emperor himself at one point in time, right? Uh, that is to Shah Jahan, because this is here I'm speaking about Shivaji's, Shivaji's father. Now, what Shivaji is going to become important for is, as I said, for pioneering a certain kind of warfare in the Indian context, which is unusual, right? And this is what might be described as guerrilla warfare. So like, like the Mughals, by the way, he's going to have a system of very elaborate forts. Some of them are quite inaccessible, quite difficult, okay, to get, to get access to. And, it, and he's going to use these as his launching pads to, in fact, wage war against the Marathas. And there's a very famous story, by the way, I mean, and this is the kind of legend of which his life is full of, and I want to just mention this story very briefly. So there's this uh, 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 Mughal general uh, by the name of Afsal Khan. Um, and if you go to my Mana site, incidentally, you're going to find this incident narrated in substantial detail, all right? So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a meeting that's, uh, that's been scheduled between them because Shivaji is supposed to surrender himself to the Mughal general here. Um, but he was quite aware of the fact, according to this story, that Afzal Khan intended to, in fact, actually kill him. Okay? So, you know, the scene that is described is that they meet each other, they hug each other, and he's wearing, Shivaji is wearing on his hands, he's wearing these, these, uh, uh, a, a kind of a uh, steel implement with very sharp nails, and so when he hugs him, he, in fact, he actually squeezes him to death with that, right? So it's a rather famous episode, uh, uh, the idea which is to suggest that Shivaji had, you know, in some ways, uh, a premonition of the fact that you couldn't trust the Mughals, right? So it, partly it's intended to convey the idea that there was a kind of a long-standing hostility that went on between Shivaji um, and the Mughals. And I think that there is some kind of long-standing hostility. It has to do in part with the fact that, that Shivaji uh, uh, is going to raid the rich mercantile towns that you're going to find in Western India. This is going to be a matter of concern to Aurangzeb because his revenue sources are being, in fact, taken away by Shivaji, right? Okay, so this is one of the main reasons why there's going to be conflict and, and Shivaji doesn't accept the authority of the Mughal emperor. In 1674, Shivaji is going to have himself crowned Chhatrapati, okay, which is Lord of the Universe. So here's, a, here's somebody who is now contesting the authority of the Mughal Emperor. And one of the most remarkable things about Shivaji, of course, is that in fact, his ascendancy illustrates, in some ways, the fluidity of the Indian system. He's actually a Shudra. Now, if, if, if I were to say this, by the way, in the state of Bombay, openly, the chances are reasonably good that somebody is going to try to lynch me, okay? We get that because that's a situation that Shivaji has been venerated to a degree which is really quite extraordinary, all right? But this is widely acknowledged by the historians who have worked on Shivaji and his background and where he come from. And what his ascendancy demonstrates is, is precisely the fact that what you can do in the Indian system here, even if you come from a lower caste background as he did, is right to the top. How do you do so? One of the ways you do so is you have your rule legitimized by the Brahmins. So when he had himself crowned as Chhatrapati Shivaji, all right, Lord of the universe, right, he hires a thousand Brahmins to come to the event and they create a genealogy for him. Right? Suggesting that he is descended from the great line of the solar kings, etc., etc. It's completely fictitious. Completely fictitious. But this is one of the ways in which political power is going to be actually exercised. So his, so his history, in fact, I think is in this respect quite extraordinary. And what he's going to create is a little empire which is called the Maratha Empire, which some decades after his death is going to become part, is going to disintegrate to what is called the Maratha Confederacy. Okay, and there are going to be several different rulers who are going to be part of the Maratha Confederacy. We're going to see the Marathas lingering on, by the way, for another 200 years. Another 200 years, you know, so long after the Mughals are going to fall into precipitous decline, the Maratha Confederacy will still continue to be important in some ways. And it's not going to be until the early 19th century 
that the British are going to be able to deal a decisive blow to the Marathas and finally remove them from the scene. Okay? Right? But what the Marathas are doing is, A, they are creating an alternative base of power in Western India. Okay? They are providing the seeds of resistance to Mughal rule. And this is going to feed into later Indian historiography, which is going to try to represent this as a kind of a Hindu-Muslim conflict. So although I don't think that this can be viewed as a Hindu-Muslim conflict. Yes, Shivaji was a Hindu, no doubt. And Aurangzeb was a Muslim, no doubt. But that doesn't mean that this was a Hindu-Muslim conflict. Right? And that's why it's important to remember that Aurangzeb is, for example, also going to deal very severely with the rulers of Golconda and Bijapur. Both of these rulers are again down in the Deccan, and they both are rulers of Shia kingdoms. He's going to deal with them equally severely as he deals with Shivaji and the Marathas. No question about that. All right? So we have to view this conflict in a different lens, but the importance of this, as I've already you know, under, underscored for you, can be, under, can be seen in a few different ways. And you have to think additionally, as I said, of the rise of the Maratha nation as a new kind of power base and Maratha warfare as a different element in the Indian military history than we've had up till this point in time. All right. Now, there is an additional factor that we have to think of. But just to sum this up here, what we're saying is there is this kind of three-pronged attack on Aurangzeb, and this is what is eventually going to lead to the decline of the Mughal Empire. Now, Aurangzeb is going to die in 1707. There is a line of succession over there, and the Mughals are going to sort of totter around. I think that's the only way to put it. They're just simply going to be around until 1857, but there are serious questions as to how powerful the Mughals are going to be in the next 50, 100 years. The other factor that now comes into play, and this brings us to really what is effectively the last phase of this course, and that is the coming of the English to India, the beginnings of colonial rule in India, leading eventually to independence in 1947. All right? But before we get to them, let's pause for a second and think about the fact that there have been Europeans in India before. And of course, the Europeans who had been present in India before were the Portuguese. Right? And one thing I want to remind you of is the fact that the Portuguese were, as I had pointed out, extremely unpopular in India. Right? So you have, the, you have you, you, the, their presence is largely confined, largely, to the southwest of India to the coastal region where they are going to build up elaborate defenses and they're going to be able to control the trade there for a period of time. There's going to be some Portuguese presence at the court of the Mughal emperor. A small Portuguese presence there because they're obviously trying to make some further inroads into India and one of the only ways you can make inroads into India at this point in time, now I'm speaking here about the early 1600s, is to have the ear of the Mughal emperor, to be able to impress upon the Mughal emperor that they have certain kinds of requirements and that they would like to be able to expand their trade activities because the Mughal emperor is all powerful at this point in time, right? So early 1600s is what I'm talking about, okay? Now the Portuguese are going to be eclipsed by the British, Okay, And to understand the circumstances of that, let me first enumerate for you the founding of the East India Company. So on the last day of 1600, 31st December 1600, Queen Elizabeth is going to agree to the demand of a body of merchants that has been making a representation to her for some period of time. And essentially this representation is that they should be given a royal charter to found a new trading company. Okay. And this trading company is going to be called the East India Trading Company. So it's founded in 1600. The Dutch East Indies Companies is going to be founded just a couple of years later. And then the French East Indies Companies is going to be founded uh, sometime, if, I, if my memory doesn't fail me, sometime in about the 1660s. Okay? Um, these, uh, and, and what is it that this East India Company expects to do? Why are they interested in undertaking these voyages to the east, okay? 
Now, you could say that, well, one of, the re one of the things that propelled them was the interest in spreading Christianity. That's possible. Uh, I don't think that we should, we should dismiss that as an argument, uh, although I don't know if, that, if there's really compelling evidence for that. Okay? The other compelling uh, reason for their entry into this trade is that they want to eliminate the middlemen, essentially what the Portuguese wanted to do. Right? Uh, what is it that they're interested in getting from India? Pepper, spices, and these spices would include um, uh, things like clove, cloves, nutmegs, cinnamon. Okay? They're interested in textiles, in saltpeter, right? which is a substance that's used in medicines, even in gunpowder. They're interested in indigo, which is a dye. Right? Of course, the interesting thing is that if they're interested in all of these things and they're going to trade with India, what is it that the Indians are going to get in return from the English? Okay? And if you read the accounts of the company's early years and what was the kind of trading that went on, well, there's really not very much, by the way, that the Indians really need from the English. I mean, at the most, you're talking about lead to some degree, small, small amounts of woolen clothing. Right? I mean, in a hot tropical country, for the most part, there's not going to be much need for woolen clothing, except if you go to the upper reaches of the Himalayas. All right? and, but, the, but if you look at central India, south India, you're talking about a hot tropical climate. Right? There's almost nothing at all frankly, that the Indians need in this trade. So what they're going to get is bullion, silver bullion, from 1633 to 1640. According to the documentary records that we have of what was carried by the ships and what, you know, from, from uh, India to Britain and then from Britain to India in return, from 1633 to 1640, the only thing that came to India on these ships was silver bullion. All right? Okay, so that's the context that you sort of can think about. A trading company has been founded. They're interested in eliminating the middlemen. There are stories that have been circulating about the fabulous wealth of the Orient. They might have contributed perhaps to some measure. One cannot say. To some degree, the spread of the idea of the spread of Christianity might have possibly been important. What is also important is the logic of European rivalry. Spain and Portugal are going to fall into decline in the 17th century. England and Holland and France are going to become the dominant powers. Right? There is a rivalry going on. And in fact, one of the reasons why the Portuguese are going to be eclipsed is that their energies are really consumed, A, with trying to keep the Dutch in check, and B, with their older rivalry with Portugal, right? So if you remember the, the papal bull that was issued 150 years ago, which carved up the world between Spain and Portugal, right? That's a context that we are talking about over here, all right? Now, let's look at a different set of considerations before we get into the nitty gritty of how the company started to spread in India, right? You know, how did it establish its factories? How did it gain the attention of the Mughal emperor and so forth, right? And the considerations that I'm most interested in at the moment here have to do with trying to understand what does the coming of the English represent to India, right? So first set of questions, what does the coming of the English to in India represent? Secondly, what might have been the pillars of British rule? in India. So we saw what the pillars of Muslim rule were, that is what was the foundation, how, what was the various ways in which the Mughals were able to consolidate the rule in India. And I had and, and given to you six or seven, eight different considerations that were quite important. Now what might be the considerations that are important when we look at the English, right? And thirdly, related to the second set of considerations, why did the British in fact succeed in India? Okay. Now each of these questions you know, deserves a course in itself. Why did the British succeed in India? Well, obviously there are a huge number of reasons why they might have, and then we might want to, of course, first ask what does success really mean, right? In the long run, right? But nonetheless, in some sense of the term, we have to try to, try to attack each of these three questions. So the coming of the English, to look at that set of, the set of considerations that are important there, the coming of the English represents 
the following. Right? First, the beginning of a different kind of maritime history in India. Okay? I mean, we, you know, if you recall the Cholas down south, deep down south in the Tamil country, were a maritime power. They established links with Southeast Asia, links between South India and Southeast Asia. But for the most part, if you think back to the last 3,000 years, right, effectively what we've been speaking about is a history of land empires. Right? So you look at the Guptas, you look at the Mauryas, look at the Kushans, right? and then you look at obviously the Delhi Sultanate, even the Bahmani Sultanate, all the way up till the Mughals. And the Mughals in fact barely had a navy, you know, comparatively speaking. Okay? Right? So what we have is a, a, is a chapter in maritime history that is going to be opened up with the coming of the English. Secondly, and this is related to the first, power is going to shift from inland to coastal areas. So there's going to be cities that are going to be established in the coastal regions. You're going to be, there's going to be, you know, uh, Mumbai, Surat is going to be important, by the way, in, in western India, Surat, Mumbai, right? And then on the, on the eastern, in eastern India, you're going to have Bengal, Calcutta, that's the city that we're speaking about, and, f and down south in Tamil Nadu, we're speaking about the city of Madras. Okay? And there are going to be other coastal areas that are going to be important as well, but these are where the big metropolises are going to come about. So there's going to be a shift from the inland to coastal areas, and when the British eventually establish themselves administratively, you're going to see that they're going to have what is called the presidency system. Okay? The presidency system. So you have the presidency of Bombay, which is going to be centered in the city of Bombay, but it's going to be a large, huge administrative area. Then there's going to be the Madras presidency down south, okay, in Tamil Nadu. And there's going to be the Bengal presidency, which is going to be based in Calcutta. Right? So the presidency system, the administrative system itself, is going to be shaped around this shift from inland to coastal areas. Thirdly, the imposition of a commercial economy. A commercial economy, you know, which is eventually going to translate into a kind of a mass-produced economy, but what it also means in this case is producing not for your own markets, but producing for external markets, okay, on a different scale than what had been attempted in India before. So that if you look at the subsistence farmer, you know, that subsistence farmer is now actually going to change, okay, the pattern of farming. So the kind of rot crop rotation that you had, this is going to disappear in many parts. Because what they're actually going to produce are the kinds of textiles, for example, okay, that are going to be able to sell overseas in European markets. And fourthly, and this of course refers to the large set of intellectual cultural considerations, the dominion of the peoples of Europe over the affairs of Asia and the affairs of India in particular. Right? This is what the coming of the English represents. And we're not going to have time to look at you know, the various ways in which the English imposed, if I may put it this way, entire knowledge systems on India. What were the ways in which they understood the country? I mean, you've had a little glimpse of that through the, through the or theory of Orientalism. Right? Okay, but what were the various kinds of Man, what were the various ways in which they established an intellectual dominion, not an economic dominion, an intellectual dominion over India? Right? Why were they interested in creating dictionaries of Indian languages? Why were they interested in creating grammars? Okay? What was the role of the archaeological survey of India, the geological survey of India, the botanical survey, the trigonometrical survey? Okay, these are different kinds of modalities through which the British are eventually going to get a grip over the country. Right? But of course when I speak about the dominion of the peoples of Europe over the affairs of India, I'm also speaking about other kinds of considerations, the entire educational system. Okay? See one of the, one of the disputes, for, to give you an illustration of what that means, right? let me just jump here 200 years ahead for a moment, one of the disputes that's going to become a really prominent dispute in the first half of the 19th century is what is called the Anglicist Orientalist 
controversy. Okay? Anglicist Orientalist controversy. And what this controversy is about is roughly the following. So this is now I'm talking about the 1820s, 1830s. Now by this time the English have established a considerable sway over North India, portions of South India as well. All right? I mean they are effectively the rulers of India at this point in time. This controversy arises for a very simple reason. There is a discussion that takes place in the government of India on how funds that have been set aside for education should be spent in the country. Should, for example, money be spent teaching students Sanskrit and Arabic and Persian? Okay? This is the position, by the way, of the so-called Orientalists. Okay? Here, by the way, the word Orientalist has a slight a different meaning than the meaning that we have been accustomed to because Orientalist here refers to those, in fact, who are in part scholars of the Oriental languages, okay? such as Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian. Okay? So the Orientalists say that, look, these languages are dear to the Indian people. We should persist with continuing to teach these languages to Indians. The Anglicists, and you can, you can surmise what their views are from the word itself, what they want to do is they want to Anglicize the country as rapidly as possible. The Anglicists, by the way, are divided into two camps. Okay? So there's one camp of Anglicists which argues that all the funds that we have for education should be spent only on teaching what is useful and practical to students. And it should be taught only in English. Okay? There's another camp of Anglicists who say that yes, that should be done. And it should be done because English is a language of modernity, right? But they say that it's useful to use authors such as Shakespeare and Milton to spread ideas about Western civilization among the Indians. The hardcore positivist Anglicist types, in fact, disagree strongly with that. Because they say that reading Shakespeare, well, in fact, actually, it's quite dangerous because Shakespeare is, not a very, is somewhat of an immoral writer. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of odd things going on in his plays. What is it that the Indians are going to learn from Shakespeare? Okay, well, they might learn a certain mastery over the language, but that would be a little bit like learning Sanskrit. What is that mastery really going to do if it's not going to be useful and practical? Okay, but nonetheless, both the camps of the Anglicists are united in their belief that Sanskrit, Arabic, and Persian are utterly useless. Utterly useless. Right? And so there's going to be a minute, a minute is an official document which is going to be written by Lord Macaulay. So this is the person who becomes a great historian of England, okay? Thomas Macaulay. And Macaulay is going to write this document, it's dated 2nd February 1835, just check it out on Google, okay? It's called the Minute on Indian Education. Uh, some people have described this as the document that enslaved Indians. Right? I mean, that's some, how some people have described it. There are other groups of Indians who say this is a document that freed the Indians forever. Right? Because what Macaulay wrote in this minute, and this became official policy, was that henceforth the funds of the government of India would be spent entirely in teaching students what is practical and useful, and English would be the medium of instruction. Okay? So when I speak about the, the, that, what does the coming of the English represent in India? So I was suggesting to you that one of the things it represents is the dominion of the peoples of Europe over the peoples of Asia, India in particular in this case. And this intellectual dominion, this cultural dominion had enormous manifestations. Right? So this is one illustration of what I mean when I speak about that dominion. Okay? the coming into effect of a new educational policy in 1835. All right? So this, this is the set of things that you might want to think about when we, when we say what does the coming of the English to India represent. Now the second set of considerations that I, that I put before you was to say, okay, what are the pillars right, of British rule in India? I mean, in the case of the Mughals, 
Recall what I said to you very briefly. I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but just so that you can keep the contrast in mind, a system of alliances with the Rajputs, okay? Increasing degree of indigenization, indigenization okay? A system of forts strategically located. The creation of a new military hierarchical elite called the Mansabdars, right? A policy of toleration and so forth and so on. In the case of the English, I want to suggest six things. There may be many more, but six that from my understanding of this period, I think are critical. First, the British argue that what they are bringing to India is the rule of law. The rule of law. Okay? And rule of law is incidentally quite a complicated term. Okay? But there is a colloquial way in which you can understand it, and the colloquial way is how states usually understand it, which is law and order. Right? That one of the obligations any nation state has, any state, not just a nation state, but any state has, is the imposition of law and order. But the rule of law, by the way, is a lot more than law and order. Okay? The rule of law is when people begin to internalize. Right? And a good illustration of that, a very simple illustration, commonplace illustration would be, you know, you arrive at a red light. Because you have internalized the system of rule of law, right? you stop at the red light. Now, it's true, perhaps at 3 a.m., you know, you might just speedily look around and you don't see anybody and you might just decide to cross, right? Particularly if it's one of these intersections where it takes two and a half minutes, you know, okay, right? But in general, you have internalized this idea that we are all subject to a system of laws, so the, so the rule of law should not be simply viewed as law and order, although, by the way, even this internalization has some relationship to the carrot and the stick. Okay? I mean, so if at 2 p.m. you tried to cross a red light at Wilshire Boulevard, I mean, short of trying to commit suicide, perhaps, or maybe at 4 p.m., you know, right? You also know that the likelihood is you're going to get a $500 ticket. So therefore, it's going to stop you from undertaking that measure. Okay? So this is what I mean, that the rule of law, in fact, has to do partly with what you internalize, but it also has to do with the powers of the state to impose certain penalties on you. The critical thing is this, that when the British say that they are bringing the rule of law to India, they are setting up a contrast with 3,000 years of Indian history. And the contrast is that before we came here, all you had was something called oriental despotism. And I don't know how many of you know the precise meaning of despotism because there's a very colloquial way in which we you know, use the word despotic. If a father is very tyrannical, we might refer to that father as despotic, for example. Okay? Administrators very often are despotic from the point of view of faculty. Okay? Right? There are many colloquial usages of the word despotic. Oriental despotism means something very precise. What it means is a political system, okay, according to the British and according to European theorists, where you have a, like a pyramid, okay, and somebody sits there at the top, here, call him the Mughal emperor, okay, or you could call him Chandra Gupta Maurya or one of the Guptas, I don't care, right? Somebody sits there at the top and only his life is secure, 100%. Except, of course, the fact that he might get assassinated, which is a different matter, right? But that nobody's life is secure because everybody is subject to the whims of the oriental despot. The oriental despot has other characteristics. By the 19th century, the British had a well-rounded portrait of him, if I may put it this way. He's well-rounded, in fact, actually, very often, because he's lazy. He smokes the hookah too much, okay? And he watches the, the notch girls. The notch girls are dancing girls, right? That's your typical oriental despot, right? According to British representations, right? But important thing is that in a system of oriental despotism, 
there is no security. The life and limb of no one person is secure except that of the person who sits at the top of the pyramid. Okay? It, this also means, by the way, I mean, there are enormous consequences which I cannot you know, relay to you in detail over here. But in part, it means that the British had a view that there were no individual property rights to be found in India. Okay? That all property, in effect, belongs to the oriental despot. Okay? And there's an old Marxist theory about this. You know, it's called the Asiatic mode of production, okay? which is related very much to this idea. Okay? Right? But this is, in short, one central plank, one central pillar of British rule, the idea that they are bringing the rule of law to India. And of course, you have to then to be able to persuade the Indians that, in effect, you have done that. Don't forget that part of the story. Right? And, and this is where Orientalism comes in. You have, to, you have to completely rewrite the histories of India and you have to write them in a certain way to ensure that the pre-colonial past is seen as one long history of Oriental despotism. Secondly, the idea of fair play. The idea of fair play. Okay? That... What characterizes the British is the fact that they are essentially A, neutral, B, they transcend the kinds of histories, animosities, and differences that characterize the relations of Indians to other Indians. Okay? Fair play. You know, in the long run, we'll deal an even hand. Okay? We're a just people, and you can count on us to do that. From my point of view, one of the more dramatic examples of that, and again, now jumping ahead, but this is one way in which we look at the history of India, is to look at what happened when the British eventually in 1946, 1945-46, at the end of World War II, decided that, well, yes, they're going to have to leave India now. Right? There are different arguments advanced as to whether the British left or whether they were kicked out. Right? We won't get detained by that consideration. The important consideration is this, that when eventually the British are going to quit India, they are going to partition the country. Okay? They're going to create a state called Pakistan. Right? Now, the most extraordinary thing is this. that So here you have this country, okay? and you're going to decide that you're going to partition. You're going to draw a line somewhere. Let's just say randomly we draw the line. Well, how do you draw a line and decide that now everybody living here, this becomes Pakistan, and this becomes India, and this, by the way, is East Pakistan, so there's another line drawn over here. Okay, That's another interesting story in itself, but East Pakistan is going to become Bangladesh in 1971. right? How do you draw the line? What they decided to do, they decided to get somebody who had absolutely no knowledge of India, to draw the line. His name is Sir Cyril Radcliffe. And he is going to be the chairman of what is called the Boundary Commission. Now, why did they decide to get somebody who had absolutely no knowledge of India whatsoever? In fact, if you read Sir, Rila, Sir Cyril Radcliffe's diary, he positively loathed the idea of even being in India. He is a jurist living in Great Britain in Scotland. Okay? He's never been to India before, has no interest whatsoever in India, and he is now going to determine the fate of millions, tens of millions of people. Right? Why did the British? Because they said, ah, you see, if we get somebody who is really experienced in Indian affairs, so let's suppose we get, we, you can't obviously get Hindus or Muslims, because the Hindus will obviously be much more sympathetic to their community. The Muslims will be much more sympathetic to their community. The Sikhs will be sympathetic to their community. And of course, this division is based, at least ostensibly, on paper, on religious lines. Okay? Right? Pakistan is going to be the land for the Muslims. Right? Ostensibly, it's based on that, on those lines. Right? But what about Englishmen who've been living in India for 30, 40 years, who've been ruling India? Well, the problem with them is not intrinsically a problem with them as such. 
It's that if you've been living in India for too long, you get influenced too much by Indians. They're constantly sitting by your side trying to feed poison into your ears, trying to influence you. So the argument is, let's get a Britisher who has absolutely zero knowledge of India. We can expect him to be completely neutral, completely neutral. He transcends all the messiness of Indian history. The messiness of Hindu-Muslim relations, Muslim-Sikh relations, the messiness of the past, right? It's like a tabula rasa, you know the Locke's phrase for a clean slate, right? It's a tabula rasa, right? He will come here absolutely fresh and innocent as a newborn babe, completely uncontaminated, and you can count on him to deliver the goods because the British are the embodiment of the idea of fair play, okay? This is going to be a central plank in British rule in India. Number three, the idea of improvement. Notice the Mughals did not say that the reason we are here, you know, because remember the, the line comes from Central Asia, Turkey. We're not here to improve you. The British claim is we're here to improve you. We're here to make you ethically, morally, materially better human beings. The phrase that is used in English, by the way, is called the civilizing mission, right? I call it the ethos of improvement. We are here to improve you, to improve your society, to ensure that you do not continue to subscribe to those barbaric practices which have characterized your past. Now, of course, this is all going to be done with a great deal of skill very often, because one of the things you have to bear in mind is the British coming to India is not quite like they're going to Africa. From their point of view, and I'm not telling you this is the objective history of Africa, I'm telling you how they're thinking about it. From their point of view, Africa, there's nothing there. I, this is a place that is waiting to be colonized. It has no history, it has no architecture, it has no great monuments, it has no literature, no theology, no philosophy. Right? This is, in short, the British view of Africa. Now, India is a bit more complicated. And they know that. I mean, when William Jones in the middle part of the 18th century, in the second half of the 18th century, you know, he's a jurist. He's an Englishman living in India. Okay? He's a jurist. And he's a scholar. And I, I don't know how many of you recall that I mentioned his name in the first week. Because when I was talking about the idea of Indo-European languages, the fact that Latin, Greek, Sanskrit are all related to each other. And they all come, derive from a common source called Proto-Indo-European. Well, the person who puts forward this argument is Sir William Jones. Now, somebody who's putting forward an argument that Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit are related and that Sanskrit is the most beautiful of all of these languages is not going to obviously come up with the idea at the same time that the Indians are barbaric. So there's a difference between the colonization of Africa and the colonization of India. Okay? But nonetheless, the idea that we have to improve these people and civilize them because they have now fallen into a state of utter decay and decadence is something that is staunchly adhered to by the British. Fourthly, the idea of divide and rule. Now this is, according to Indian nationalist historians, this is the biggest plank, right? The old school of Indian nationalist history always insisted that this was the way in which the British were able to maintain their rule. You play off one Indian ruler against another. Right? And we're going to see to what extent this is the case. I think there's no question that to some extent this is important. And when we look at the Battle of Plassey in my next lecture, right, or very early on Friday in 1757, we're going to find that this is going to be an important argument. Fifthly, a system of efficient administration. Right? The British undoubtedly bring with them a system of administration which is more modern and efficient. And this is one of the things that Nehru talks about. Now here again we have, to be, we have to be a bit more nuanced because the Mughals had an effect, very effective system of administration. There's just no question about that. And if you recall that one of the things that Akbar did was he in fact even dispensed with the office of the chief minister so that there would be no rival center of authority that would develop to him, to the Mughal emperor. 
right, and created these other offices, right? The, the division of the empire into subas, into provinces, you could say that to some extent it anticipates the presidency system of the English, in fact. All right? There are many ways in which, and I think we are beginning to understand that better today than we did three, four decades ago. Many ways in which the British, in fact, relied upon the Mughal system of administration. But nevertheless, there is a kind of modern efficiency, what today would be called management, okay, which I think the British bring into their systems of administration. All right. And lastly, the last pillar of British rule is a system of direct and indirect rule, a combination of the two. What I mean by that is, even at the height of their power, the British did not directly govern all of what is called India. So you have to make a distinction between what is called British India, which is roughly two-thirds of India, and those parts of India <coughs> where they permitted native rulers to continue to rule. But they exercised supervision over these indirect rule, over these kingdoms where you had indirect rule. So they would post a person, the person is called the resident. So at the court of the ruler of Avad, as an illustration, the British had a resident. And the resident would report directly to the governor general. Okay, But the idea was you allow native rulers a certain degree of autonomy. They cannot have diplomatic relations with foreign states, for example. Okay, They cannot have their own military. right? But you allow them a system of autonomy. So it's a combination of direct rule and indirect rule which facilitated British expansion and British consolidation of their own rule in India. Right? These are the six pillars that you want to keep in mind as we now continue to move into the period of British history in India.